Hello. Welcome to episode number 62 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, as always, with my incredible, really, he is, incredible co-host, Vala Offshore. Hey, Vala. Michael. How you Vala, doing? how are you? Good seeing you. It is good to see you, as always. <laughs> and again, we have a tremendous guest here today. We have an incredible guest today and a, and a unique guest. In, in 62 episodes, we have not had a guest with with this mix of responsibilities, and I'll, I'll let you talk about that a bit. <laughs> yes, our guest today is Eduardo Conrado, who is the Senior Vice President of both IT and Marketing for Motorola Solutions. Eduardo, how are you today? Doing great. Good afternoon, Michael and Bala. Thank you so much for taking the time and joining us. My pleasure. So, Eduardo, you're... You are the, the boss of both IT and marketing. That's a pretty unusual combination to bring together. So tell us briefly about your professional background and then maybe describe your role at Motorola and what do you do? Perfect. That's a great question. You know, you, you said it's an unusual combination. I think last year at a, at a show when I gave a talk about marketing and IT, somebody called me a strange beast, something that you <laughs> see out in the wild that often. <laughs> I only hear that at home. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, well, what's your very briefly? What's your professional background? So, I'm a engineering by uh, study undergrad. I studied industrial engineering. I actually only worked as an engineer for a couple of years uh, out of school with Texas Instrument, and the last 20 years uh, have been uh, both in consumer and B2B marketing within Motorola. So, pretty much all the business. Uh, spanning from product marketing to the traditional brand out to field marketing. And for the last six quarters, I've also had IT responsibilities under me. So how did the marketing and IT combination come about? That's, it's it's uh, at, at the scale of Motorola, your role is truly uh, unique in the industry based on, based on my perspective. And, and that's true. I mean, I think when we had the discussion on the value that IT provides to the business, hmm. I think it gets reflected on where IT reports into uh, within the executive committee. So I think in rough numbers, about a third of the CIOs report into the CEO, which was not our case over the last six years. The other two-thirds traditionally report either to the CFO or operations. So if you report to the CFO, and I'm generalizing, IT tends to become a, a cost center and kind of focus on a lot of the back office applications. If it reports to operations, it uh, tends to be uh, supply chain driven, so factories, distribution centers. Uh, and as part of our strategy, we want to be Motorola Solutions, we want it to be focused all around the customer. So start with the customer first and then work our way back. And as we we're looking to realign IT, that's where we wanted to put the IT, not so much in the back office, but sure. front office, customer facing, channel facing, and sales facing. And if it was not going to report to the CEO, the two other areas that are customer facing are sales and marketing. Sure. So I raised my hand up and I said, you know what, I think uh, I know the IT area very well. I've been working on it for the last 10 years on the marketing side. And I thought I could change the strategy of IT both organizationally on the processes that we run inside the company, but also a holistic view around the architecture and adding value around the front office. Well, you wrote a beautiful uh, Harvard Business Review blog that challenged marketeers, especially B2B marketeers, noting it's time for us to rethink the four P's, which, right. uh, which is uh, you know something that you learn through you know studying marketing and then certainly trying to practice that. And and can you talk a little bit about that because you just you just mentioned being customer focused, solution oriented. You know, customers aren't thinking about products as top of mind. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it really helps with the, the logic behind technology-driven company like Motorola having someone oversee marketing and IT. I, I agree. So when maybe four years ago, my team and I were looking at how does Motorola evolve to be a solutions company for bringing a high-tech product-centric company. And, and we reverted back to the four Ps, the simplest definition of marketing. If you think about it, they were created in the 60s. A CPG based model, so mostly consumer focus. And if you turn that and focus around high tech solutions company, the four P's were outdated. So we started looking at 
how the evolution will take place both in the organization and then the skills and ultimately the technology that marketing will use to talk to our customers. So we said products have to move over to a solution. And it sounds simple, but it's a mindset. If you think most companies have product marketing and product and that gets flipped to think about solutions more around vertical and the value that you bring to your customers at the end. Same thing with, with price. Uh, when you think about price, you get into a conversation that should be more based around value. What, what's the ultimate problem that you're trying to solve for the customer? And get into that value discussion and not so much around speeds and feeds. When you think about place, um, it actually becomes around a, a conversation around access. So as you start thinking about not only talking to the customer face-to-face, -face, traditionally through the websites, but most customers are consuming information way before they talk to one of our salespeople. So holistically, as you're thinking about access, you've got to think about the whole ecosystem of information consumption by the customer, including social, digital, and how do you push that information out there. And ultimately, I think customers are trying to look of, uh, to learn and create more education. So instead of doing promotions out with, the, with uh, a customer, you actually go into education. And that's where we came up with the SAFE model where you have this thought leadership, a point of view of where the future is, start with the customer and back into what the solution is or actually how do you solve the problems and not necessarily start talking about technology or a product itself. Well, it's very interesting. You know, you talk about uh, the CIO having the value discussion rather than just feeds and speeds. And we have a comment from Gregory Yankelevich, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, on Twitter, who makes the point regardless, and I'm quoting from, from his tweet, he makes the point, Regardless of where the CIO reports, the primary obligation is continuity of the business, i.e. risk management. And that's a very traditional IT perspective. And so how do you reconcile the feeds and speeds perspective with the, the value conversation? So that's a great point. So I think continuity of the business, and I would add security into that, to me are table stakes on what a CIO should do. That's a requirement, baseline. So assume that that's a requirement for every role. But if you back into how most IT departments are set up, they're functionally aligned. You got IT for HR, finance, supply chain, sales, and marketing. And I think that's the wrong way to kind of view IT. So what we ended up doing with my team similar to your question around the four Ps and blowing them up and taking a new approach. We did the same thing a couple of years back with IT and we said, uh, does the traditional IT setup actually match the requirements of customer expectations and comp company expectations? And we ended up blowing up that functional alignment of IT and actually have five, I would say six key areas that IT uh, provides value. And it centers around the customer, it centers around operation and security. So there are four main areas that centers around the main processes or values that we have. So we borrowed a little bit from Jeffrey Moore, and we said the front office, all the relationship systems that the company has, mm -hmm. systems of engagement, one lead for that, which encompasses marketing, sales, and services. And it flows from the customer back into the company. And that area has responsibility for the data, master data strategy of the company. So instead of the data residing in the back, we said the systems of engagement where the customer lives has the responsibility for the master data strategy of the company to be able to drive analytics. Then we flipped it and we said all the back-end systems that are transactional in nature, where finance, supply chain lives, or systems of record, one lead for the company that looks at the overall end-to-end -end processes. That way the customers flow from systems of engagement back into the systems of record. And then we added two other systems, which many, I think, IT departments forget. We said there's innovation that gets developed in the company, all around the engineers that we have, both in software and hardware, and there's a whole set of tools and systems that they use. So we created a systems of innovation team that has one lead and focuses around engineering community. And lastly, when you think about the employees, they're people, they live within the company, 
but mostly we're enabled by technology on the day-to-day -day interactions, and that impacts the culture of the company. So all the tools that an employee has that has a huge impact on the company is the systems of collaboration. So we have one lead looking at that holistically, not just telephony, email, the social platforms that we use inside. Mm. How do we do video at, along major locations? So as you step back and look at IT, not a functional alignment, but look at systems of engagement, that look at relationship, systems of record, transactions, systems of innovation, how we develop solutions, and ultimately systems of collaboration on how do we enhance the culture of the company through the tools that we put in place. And foundationally, cybersecurity and operations which enable the continuity of the business going forward. What, what percentage of your time um, is, is IT versus marketing? Because again, as, as, as a chief marketing officer, I'm, I'm pretty busy just managing the marketing function. So I'd like to know, you know, uh, the percentage of time you spend, and then, you know, maybe your organizational structure in in IT um, supporting your marketing needs. All right, perfect. So I try to balance it out 50-50 in terms of, of my time between marketing and IT. Hmm. Um, some quarters, like this quarter, uh, since we're doing our three-year planning for IT, I'm a little bit heavier on the IT side. Sure. Um, but if you get a good team underneath, I can I can step back and forth with, between the worlds. If you look at the IT structure that supports marketing, uh, that resides within the systems of uh, engagement team. Okay. So there we have a single lead for marketing, sales, and services in the company. And the reason we did that is that if you look at the systems of marketing use, they actually is a continuum between or marketing automation systems, or CMS platforms for running .com, or social platforms. Mm -hmm. They tie into the marketing, autom the sales automation systems that we have. How, how do we manage leads end to end? And ultimately, that ties into our services systems within the company. So we have an IT team that's dedicated into marketing, but it overlaps with sales and, and services. When you talk about IT being customer-centric, what exactly does that mean? So, so who is your customer and that, your IT customer, and then how does that intersect with marketing? That's a good one. So when you think about IT-centric IT, -centric IT um, systems of engagement, so all the relationship systems that sit in the front office, we start with let's say, uh, an end user customer that we have, how do they interact with the, co with the company along all the touch points that we had, both digital and non-digital? In all cases, we have a system sitting in the back that, that does that. In the past, so if I go back five years, we would do a system implementation, and we would start with the software. And how do we architect that software out towards the customer? And looking within the silo, so if you were doing Salesforce automation, you would do a Salesforce automation implementation within that silo. Now, if you flip that and you start with the customer, we actually have uh, user experience experts sitting with the IT teams right at the beginning, not at the end where they're doing the UX, UI and UX design, but at the beginning where they're looking at the whole customer journey and they're designing along with the IT architects, what does that journey look like from the customer and the impact that it has on the digital uh, footprint on the company? And ultimately, it has an impact on the requirements that we give IT to build out the, the system or architecture that we're going to put in place. So you have, so when you're designing the, the uh, so marketing designs the customer journey, but does so in conjunction with IT so that the technology and the customer goals are, are moving in lockstep all the time. That's right. And then an additional benefit of that that we haven't had in the past is when we look at the funding model and the projects that we're going to be running for the next two years um, around the front office, we actually have marketing, sales, services, and IT sitting in the same room. So when we do the portfolio planning, we look at across all the touch points with the customer and how we're funding them over that time period. So instead of IT talking to marketing and a separate IT talking to sales on individual projects, we look at all the relationship systems that the company has and have a single conversation where we all agree on, and then that creates a tight interconnect uh, between all the groups around the customer. 
you mentioned uh, marketing automation and understanding the impact of your campaigns and lead nurturing. So when you're looking to add, you know, data scientists or folks with deep analytical skills um, to perhaps, you know, understand the whole customer acquisition funnel and marketing automation, are, they, are you hiring data experts into IT, into marketing, or, or, or both? So initially we started um, hiring data experts into marketing. Okay. Um, where we are right now in the discussion is that as we evolve the capabilities, the data experts are actually going to go into the systems of engagement team that are sitting within IT that are working with marketing sales and services so that we have a, a single pool that allows us to architect the data correctly within our internal systems, allows for us to view the data as is required, and then ultimately provide value to it. That's very interesting. So tell us now, we've been talking a lot about the marketing side, but tell us a little, I'm sorry, we're, we've been talking about the IT side, but tell us now a little bit about uh, marketing and what the marketing team is doing from a digital perspective and how it, that group interfaces with IT, but again, this time from the marketing perspective. Perfect. So if you think about marketing and sales, we work together on the digital strategy for the company since we're uh, heavily B2B on what we do. We look at the complete funnel for the corporation. So when we're thinking about marketing automation and campaign management for outbound and inbound, we work very closely with the IT teams to tie that into the sales tools that we have. So when we get launch a campaign, we may get a lead to one of our systems. That lead, we can actually track it when we give it to one of our channel partners or one of our direct sellers. Um, it, it's changed a, a little bit the thinking, I think, uh, around how marketing enables uh, the funnel. It changed our ability to rethink on how we view data, not just the top of the funnel in terms of where marketing ends at a marketing qualified lead, but we take it all the way down to sales acceptance and ultimately to a closure. And even if we don't close the sale, we'll continue the conversation with the customer using our digital systems. It's, it, it, it's, it's just such a tremendous amount of discipline and, and from, from, you know, from culture to the, to the right people and skill set to, to the right processes to, to achieve what I think all of us in marketing want to better understand, which is the effectiveness of a campaign. And sure. you, know, you mentioned marketing qualified lead and sales accepted. I mean, ultimately, whether it's Cirrus Decision or Marketa Alakoya, whomever, there are about seven traditional stages in the marketing funnel. And it is incredibly important for IT and marketing to be lockstep to be able to capture the insights that, that you need. Uh, you know, where do you, how do you, what type of collaboration tools or processes do you use so that, you know, all of the stakeholders have a common view of what you're trying to accomplish in terms of the, in terms of the analytics? So that's a, that's a great question. When you talk about collaboration tools, one of the things that we looked at was that traditionally we have been an, e an e email-centric company. Sure. And when you do that, you communicate to one-to-many or one-to-one, -one, but you lose the knowledge that's within the email um, to the broader population. So a year back, we ended up actually putting a social platform within the company oh. that enables uh, broader collaboration across all the teams. Um, great by knowledge to uh, spur ideas. We tied the collaboration platform actually to our HR system so that when we look at the profiles, and we were talking a little bit earlier in, in, about LinkedIn, in most companies, employees have a better LinkedIn profile than what they have uh, in their HR systems inside the company. Sure. So we, we just made it easy for employees to take the HR system, look at the profile that they have, build on it, actually pull in from LinkedIn if they want, tie your collaboration platform to that, and then so when you're trying to look for an expert, it's easy to find an expert within the company. As you collaborate in close or open groups, or, or social platform enables that knowledge to be brought up to the forefront, 
And what we've been seeing is it's almost self-help. Somebody might post a question in the community, and you got people jumping in from all over the world. So I think we've been able to break down walls between functional areas, but also break down distance between teams that are located in the different countries. Huge plus in communication and collaboration using that platform versus using traditional email. Is this a custom solution, or you know, uh, uh, from a from a uh, you know a other another vendor? No, it's a off-the-shelf solution that we got from a software vendor. We ended up uh, customizing it in terms of the look and feel for sure. the company, and then linking it into some of the other systems that we have. So just make it easy for for adoption. Great. You have said in the past that IT should drive culture change. That seems uh, you don't you don't hear too many people talking about IT being the ones driving culture change. So maybe you can talk, elaborate on that. No, IT and marketing play a huge role on culture change. So the marketing side is easy, right? So when you're a purpose-driven company and you are based on brand values, that impacts the culture of the company internally. And marketing and HR work very closely on that. IT has a equal impact within employees in that area. So if you think about it, most people in a company get often go back to out of the purpose and values, but that is enabled through IT systems. And that's the key part that IT can enable. When you look at how we communicate as, a, as an employee base, social platform, huge impact on culture in terms of creating connectivity and breaking down boundaries. Like today, we're using video. Right. If, uh, in the past, most people communicated through email and phone. Email tends to be impersonal. And phone, you lose the emotional link because you don't get to see the face. IT also has the need to be able to deploy video capabilities within the company. So as you put in video and you put in social platforms and you break down those boundaries, you can definitely change the culture of a company. Sure. Well, you, I mean, you're leading by example. You're active on social media. Uh, and I see you on Twitter. I see your video blogs. And obviously, I referenced your Harvard Business Review blog. So you're active externally, and clearly you're active internally with collaboration. What are some of the challenges or cultural barriers or training and tools you needed to put into play to have IT embrace? And I'm assuming it was maybe a bit more difficult to have IT adoption of social, but maybe that's not maybe that's not accurate. Uh, you know, what are some of the ways where you're championing collaboration throughout Motorola? I think part of it has to do a lot of it has to do with change management. Uh, we're an 86-year-old company, mm -hmm. and through that, you end up building certain ways to communicate. The systems of a company are the tapestry of the history of the company in, in many cases. What we have put in place have been done through acquisitions or divestitures, and what you have is um, a network based off of that. I think when you go forward and you, you're trying to change the culture, change management on getting people comfortable with doing things different is key. I think you got to lead by example. And as people get more comfortable, you get, you get to see it taking off like wildfire. So you mentioned active on Twitter and blogs. When we put our social platform inside the, the company, you started seeing employees around the world actually almost taking that same approach inside, mm -hmm. taking a point of view, sharing uh, content that they've seen in other places. And then actually employees started writing blogs inside the company with the point of view that they have either on something that's going on in our industry, something that they're seeing with the customer. And that enables learning to happen inside a company that's not formalized. You're learning not through a course, but you're learning through employees sharing, which that's the beauty of kind of systems enabling that culture change. How big is your IT organization? I'm just, just curious. Employees, number of employees. So number of employees, I think we have stated uh, there were 21,000, 22,000 employees around the world. Uh, around the IT organization, we're a little bit south of 400 um, IT employees that are Motorola batch. We have outsourced over the last 10 years a lot of the just app support and ongoing operations. So non Motorola batch, we got a few other hundreds that are that are out there. Wow, that's excellent. We have a few questions from Twitter, so let's go there. And to begin with, uh, Lauren Brussel, who is a writer at CIO Magazine asks two questions. So we're going to 
We're going to let her slide in two questions. Uh, <laughs> question number one is, what kind of employees do you hire at Motorola? So let's start with that. What kind of employees do you hire? So mix uh, bag of employees. We have employees that are fresh out, uh, coming out of universities around the world, and moving into entry-level positions or new skill sets that we bring in the company. We also have employees that have been in the company for many years, so long tenure employees with, uh, with the company around the world. So it creates a dichotomy, right? So you might have an employee that's been 20 years with the company sure. with somebody that's been a fresh out. Uh, but it goes back to, that ties directly to a challenge that IT has where I think uh, one of the research firms, Forrester, had done a study that asked employees of companies around the world and said, do you have better tools at home or at work in terms of communication, and, and they meant social tools, video, and I think over first 50 percent of the respondents said, "Hey, I got better better tools at home." The younger you got, the higher the percentage became, right? Sure. So the expectation is, so if you're in your mid 20s coming out of college, I bet over 70 percent of the kids will say, "Hey, you know what? I got better tools at home." If you fast forward that in terms of what the company will look like 10 years from now, you got to start thinking of the fresh outs coming into Motorola, and how do you set up a IT infrastructure or systems of collaboration that enables or employees to communicate the way that they do at home inside the company? So you have a mixture of uh, older established people who know the history of the company and younger folks as well. That's now, right. Now, Lauren, her next question is, what social platforms are you currently using? And my guess is that she wants you to name names. So if you're comfortable naming names, then do so. And if not, then then don't. So inside inside the company, um, that we like as I mentioned earlier, we do have a social platform that's tied into the email systems and all the other systems that we communicate. And I think that has taken off like wildfire uh, mm -hmm. in terms of usage and value that we're seeing. Then externally, in terms of social platforms, we use the, the traditional means in terms of Twitter. Facebook, and then private blogs and private social sites where we enable our customers, channel partners, and customers to collaborate um, and even provide those product ideas or product enhancements that, that we, should, we should make. We're hearing more and more this phrase, digital business transformation. Um, you know, I would like to know your definition of what does that mean and, and then perhaps your you know, mid to long term vision and roadmap in terms of digital business transformation within Motorola? So we've been um, using that term inside the company also. If you think about when I took over IT a few quarters back, one of the reasons for that was to better align IT with uh, the business strategy of Motorola solutions. So how do we enable the acceleration of moving to be a more of a solutions-oriented company? Not only in the way that we sell, the way that we create uh, solutions and products for our customers, but also how do we collaborate um, across the expertise around the world. Once we step back, there were four key areas that we looked at. Traditionally, IT was running siloed programs, as I mentioned, more functional areas. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to set, step back and treat our IT investments as an overall portfolio of the company that were interlinked. Okay. We, wanted, we wanted to move away from systems implementation, so software implementation that was tied into the program, and have IT enable end-to-end -end processes within the company. And that spans across multiple silos or, mul or multiple software uh, that we may have in place. So a broader architecture of end-to-end -end processes on how the customers flow. Sure. We also wanted IT to look at data not locked in into a software ERP data or Salesforce automation data, but look at data as an asset of the company and provide insights based on that data. So when you talk about analytics, analytics doesn't happen that easy unless you architect your data in a way that enables it to be uh, rich of insights that can be provided out there. And then ultimately move IT to have more of an agile approach of getting uh, away from multi-year long-term project implementation to actually have quick wins as we went along. Now, very often in, in many companies there is a significant tension that exists 
between IT and marketing. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's a stretch to say that many CIOs, or at least a lot of CIOs, believe that marketing is kind of a funnel to take away budget that rightfully belongs to them. <laughs> and at the same time, marketing complains, uh, or IT compl so IT complains that marketing doesn't respect the need for security and all of these things. And marketing complains that IT is too slow. So how do you reconcile these kind of almost natural tensions that exist between the two groups? And they both roll up to you. That's right. So I mean, if that applied to us, what you just described, that would have to be on a couple of dozen of pills to be able to kind of manage. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think traditionally, that, that does happen. I mean, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, in most companies, IT is, is so focused around the back office systems that it tends to forget the customer facing systems that impact both marketing and sales. And, and that's what leads to the creation of tension, which goes back to budget allocation. So if you're focused on ERP deployments or manufacturing and distribution systems deployments, those are multi-year projects that tend to suck up most of your budget. If you have that balance between systems of engagement, your front office relationship systems, and systems of record, your back office, where you look at them both with the same importance and you balance the investments between both back office and front office, that will tend to diffuse the, the tension and increase the collaboration between the teams. So I think that's why you see kind of that traditional tension happening between marketing and IT. First of it is where IT has been focused on the past. Second sure. is led on where the IT budget is allocated. And thirdly has led to marketing putting their own operational money and making decisions on the front office independent of IT. Sure. Um, so the benefit that I have in Motorola is that we have first both of the areas combined <laughs> on their, my, uh, my preview, but more importantly, I think I've broken down those functional silos and tried to balance our investment and portfolio view around both the front and the back office. Sure. But so so, so oh, a, gr no, a, a growing title in the C-suite for the last couple of years has been the chief digital officer you know, an individual with maybe perhaps one foot in IT, one foot in marketing, you serve that role, but I'm wondering within for perhaps your system of engagement function, do you have an individual or individuals that are responsible for defining the vision roadmap and, 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 and for mobile, social, cloud, big data applications and other, you know, technology trends that are typically the responsibility of a chief digital officer? Yeah, we do. I think the or lead for systems of engagement or relationship or front office facing systems is what you describe as the chief digital officer. And I think I would I would like to change that title from chief digital officer to actually chief experience officer, ah. because what you're enabling is an experience to happen digitally in some cases, and in some cases might be personal, but powered by a digital system in the back end. And if you have a chief experience officer kind of taking that role. They're looking at end-to-end -end experience of the customer that is digitally enabled. And I think that's where you get the beauty of the combination of those two roles. So you're spending, so is it correct to say that you're spending quite a bit of time in terms of mapping out that end-to-end -end experience both on the level of uh, customer experience on the one side and the technology to support that customer experience, whether it's uh, physical experience or digital experience. That's right. Um, and, and one of the things that the end benefits that I've been seeing as we started doing that is as you map out the digital experience for a customer, let's say in the front office, and you start matching that up with the architecture within the company, you start seeing things that you would do different because you're having a conversation that spans across marketing, sales, and services and looking at the architecture holistically. And then so you start making decisions on vendors, on stacks that you're going to be putting in place, on how the data is going to flow um, across systems. And then so there's some additional benefits that I think that your customers are going to see from the way that they interact with you. I think you're going to benefit from the way that we budget. But also I think it simplifies the way that we move. 
Sure. To what extent does uh, shadow IT exist uh, within Motorola? And what are your views on that? So I think we got into a point where it's minimal. I have visibility to probably 98% to 95% of all investment that is made uh, within the company. Technology, and technology investment. Technology investment. Okay. Wow. And the budget may not be sitting in IT budget in, in the cases, but I get to see sure. the projects, and I get to slot them within the portfolio view. We got them better and better. So I think when, when you think about shadow IT, um, when you have rogue projects that might surprise you, we've been trying to minimize that because we go in and talk holistically in terms of the portfolio management that we do over a three-year period, and everybody sees the value of where the projects fit in, and if it makes sense doing a project now or not. If we run out of IT funding and we decide to fund it out of a business budget, then we, we do the discussion at that time. So it minimizes the, the shadow IT component uh, within Motorola. How about shadow marketing? <laughs> no. what, is, what is shadow marketing? That's a good question. <laughs> no, we used to have shadow marketing 10 years ago. Uh, um, shadow marketing is marketing that no one ever sees. <laughs> um, Lo Lauren Broussel from CIO Magazine asks a, a follow-up question, and, and I was wondering this too. So, so you were talking about the uh, driving alignment between IT and marketing through budget allocations, yep. which naturally leads to the question, uh, and this is this is her question: Who has the higher budget? And she also wants to know, uh, and in the future, who should have the higher budget? So, how do you do the allocations between marketing and IT? So, the to her first question, IT has a higher budget than than marketing. I wish I had the IT budget and the marketing side. <laughs> um, and then, when we do the allocation, we actually base it on the business strategy of the of the company. To tell you the truth, I mean, if if you kind of elevate it. IT being a business enabler, we're actually sitting in the room when we make the, the budget decisions for the portfolio of the next two years. Not just marketing and IT are sitting in the room, but it's marketing, IT, sales, services, and, and even our supply chain and finance team. So holistically, when we look at all the investments that we make, uh, we all push to say, OK, this was make sense for the company, not necessarily just a function. What are your views on uh, cloud computing? So we're, from our compute line, you know, we had data centers all over the world with servers kind of sitting out there. We've been moving heavily into virtualizing that into our cloud. Um, okay. We've gone probably from about 20% virtual to, at the end of this year, we're going to be over 70% uh, virtual and sitting on the, on the cloud. More and more of the investments that we're making on software there are software that are sitting on a cloud environment. It might be a, a private cloud that we might be running, but we're moving in that direction heavily, both on the compute side and then the way that we deploy software around the company. Wow. So we have another question from Twitter, and we're, we're going to soon we're going to run out of time. So I'm going to ask you to keep your answers relatively short so we can get as many of these as we can. OK? Yeah. Uh, so this is from Brian Fanzo, who I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, who I saw just uh, put on Twitter that he is a community manager. And so he asks, how do you train your team to show the value of creating experiences and engaging with the community? So how do you train your team on the value of engaging with community? First, you've got to pro provide some guidelines that get uh, people comfortable with participating uh, so that they feel safe by having an opinion and even being active in the community um, externally. I imagine this is an external question in terms of our external communities. Once we started doing that, communicating uh, the do's and don'ts of participating in a community and not putting roadblocks for people to do it, we started mm -hmm. seeing people that had a point of view and an opinion getting active on the external basis. That was not so much of an issue on the internal communities because I think uh, if you get an open culture, you're going to have people feeling comfortable with the participation and providing a point of view. So the key point is is making sure that people feel safe and that they can uh, engage in the community without fear of reprisals based on the... Exactly. exactly. That's a key point there. OK. And then we have a question from Erling Amundsen. And again, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, he Who would like to hear more on why a chief digital officer rather than a... No, wait. 
hear more on why a chief digital officer is a chief experience officer? I think it's a nuance on chief digital. When I think about that, I think technology. When you think chief experience, you think end user and customer. That's enabled through technology. Uh, and small nuance, but I think user-centric design is the future of IT. And that nuance of the chief, chief experience officer uh, enables you to kind of start with the end user and work your way back into the way that you architect your, your systems. Do you, do you foresee sometime in the near future marketing hires will have to have a technology background? Mathematics, statistics, computer science, uh, engineering design. Um, I mean, it feels like it's more of a science than art as we, as, 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 as we you know, look to serve our customers across multiple channels and multiple uh, technologies. I think, I think it will be. I mean, I'm biased because I'm a, we're a technology company, mm -hmm. but more and more we're hiring fresh outs. So your question, I think somebody had earlier, from University of Illinois management and technology program, where they're almost hybrids. They're sitting in the business schools, but they're also taking technology courses. So they feel comfortable dealing with technology as an enabler. They feel comfortable with data as an enabler. So I think you're still going to have the creative types in marketing, but you're going to see a definite increase on technology background. Here's a question I get asked surprisingly often, uh, and it's usually coming from people who, from, from pe parents who have kids either in junior high school or in high school. And the question is, what should my kid do? What's, what's the, you know, it's going to be something related to technology, so what should my kid do? Should they become a CIO? Should be, what? A application developers. Yeah, anyway, so <laughs> what's, your, what's your advice to those folks? So I agree with your recommendation. I mean, I think a technology education, independent if you ultimately want to be a CIO or not, um, is foundational. You can go into business. You can do marketing. I think it opens many more doors. Uh, ultimately, what you want to do in terms of becoming a CIO or becoming a developer, personal preference. You just got to have passion behind what you do. Um, technology foundation, a little bit of passion, I think will guide you a long way. Sure. I okay. usually tell them, tell, tell, your, tell your kid to become a data scientist. We'll guarantee good employment for the next number of years. According to McKenzie, for sure, uh, they, they claim we're going to have close to 200,000 shortage in data scientists yeah. analytic by, by the end of this decade. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a tough question, and I'm going to put you on the spot, and I, so I apologize in advance. Which do you like more? The, the IT side or the marketing <laughs> side? And, and this is just the, among that's us. That's not fair. That's like asking. That's just among us. Yeah, Nobody's, among no us one's listening. That, that's like asking <laughs> which of my kids. Yeah. I know. I know. I, you know, I just want to know. It's, it's, it's <laughs> because you're, you know, in such, you're in such a unique position of scale and the magnitude of resources and functions you have. I, I really, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can name another executive of your scale that has both marketing and IT. So you're, you know, it's a very unique position for, based on my, my experience? Well, that's a great question. To tell you the truth, I mean, I've been working in marketing many years, and I love what marketing can do. I've come to appreciate IT in terms of the value that it provides a company, mm. and 80% of the time, I love IT. I mean, to tell you the truth, thinking about strategy, how do we impact the customer, how do we impact the company, being knee-deep in technology, it's awesome. So the IT component, 80% of the time, love it. The 20% of the time that I don't love, <laughs> it's when I get a call on a Saturday or a Sunday from <laughs> one of those 20,000 employees. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think, it's, uh, I think it's just about that time. That's fast 45 minutes. It's a very fast 45 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> we have been talking with Eduardo Conrado, who is the Senior Vice President of both IT and Marketing at Motorola Solutions. And unfortunately, this conversation could go on a long time, Absolutely. But, but we're out of time. I'm Michael Krigsman, my delightful co-host, Vala <laughs> Offshore. Vala? Michael, great show. And we want to say a heartfelt thanks to our guest, Eduardo Condrado. Eduardo, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Michael, Vala, it's been a pleasure. And everybody watching, I hope that you will tune in again next week, and I hope you have a great week in the meantime. Bye-bye. <laughs>